Okay, uh, welcome to Wednesday's lecture. We're gonna resume with where we left off uh, yesterday. So um, yesterday we finished reflection and refraction, total internal reflection, index of refraction, uh, traveling from different media. And uh, the last bit of yesterday's lecture, we started with um, spherical mirrors. Uh, and we will, after, we done, after we're done spherical mirrors, we will go on to lenses as well and lens systems. So um, what we did yesterday in the last little bit was we introduced some new terms. So we coined a notion of a virtual image and a real image. And just to recap, a virtual image is an image that is formed by a reflective surface, whether it be a plane mirror or a spherical mirror, uh, in that the image does not have any light rays physically located where we perceive the image to be. So an example of a virtual image would be when you look at yourself in, the, in a mirror in your bathroom. You perceive yourself to be, I don't know, let's say a meter behind the mirror. But of course, a meter behind the mirror is nothing. It's your wall or another room in your house. Um, there, is, there is no light making that image one meter behind the, the mirror. So that is an example of, of a virtual image. A real image, is where um, light rays are actually coming together uh, at a location to form the image. Meaning if you were to put your eye there, your eye would see the image. Um, it doesn't have to be your eye, it could also be a screen. If you take a white sheet of paper and you place a white sheet of paper at that location, you will see an image on the white sheet of paper. In fact, it's a real image is, is how a camera works. Uh, the lens in a camera will, will take the image of real life and the location of the image of the lens will be at the location of the film in the camera. Now, I don't really know which camera is filmed nowadays, but the same premise is true, I guess. Instead of film, you have a sort of a, a digital version of film, and it's, this, it's the same premise optically. Um, we also have this notion of an inverted versus an erect image. So an inverted image is, a, is an image that is upside down compared to real life, and an erect or an upright image is, is obviously an image that is upright. Um, we looked at the definition of ma um, magnification, and we've used the word magnification in real life. I mean, magnifying glass, magnifying glasses makes things bigger. Um, I think even in high school, you've had the privilege of using uh, something like even a simple microscope. And if you, re you know, remember on those microscopes, they have a little wheelie knobs at the bottom. They've got like five times magnification, 10 times, 40 times magnification. And as the magnification number gets bigger, the object that you look at through the eyepiece is perceived to be larger. You're zooming in. So the definition, the very like basic definition of magnification is the height of the image compared to the height of the object. So if the height of the image is twice as large uh, as, as it is compared to the object, then the magnification is two. You've enlarged it by a factor of two. And the last thing that we talked about yesterday was the sign convention. Meaning, when we start representing these things mathematically in terms of coordinates and space and, you know, it's, this is in front of the mirror, this is behind the mirror, the distances that we use to represent these quantities have to have either a positive or a negative sign associated with them. So this is what we call the sign convention. If, if light physically passes through the location of the image, then the distance to the image is considered to be positive. If light does not pass through the location of the image, like a virtual image, then that distance is defined to be negative. And that's what we call a sign convention. There's nothing in nature that says that this has to be true. I mean, in a very fundamental level, math itself is made up. You know, math isn't real. Uh, and I know a bunch of mathematicians are probably going to hate me for saying that. But, um, you know, math is an invented tool that we've used to analyze things. So, you know, the sign convention is, is simply just that, it's a convention. So as long as we stay consistent with our convention, then we should not run into any issues. So picking up where we left off um, is right here. Now, if we have a plane mirror, just to, just to recap from yesterday, if we have a plane mirror, then let's say you have an apple right here and there's always a little stem on the apple, right? Then the light rays from the apple or your face when you look in the mirror will hit the mirror and the light rays are, you know, obviously traveling radially outwards. 
in every direction away from the apple, and they strike the mirror as follows. Now, the law of reflection kicks in, and angle in equals angle out, and if you were to place your eyeball here, your eye would see, if you trace backwards, your eye would be tricked, your brain and your eyes would be tricked into thinking that the apple was over here. Tricked into thinking it. It's not actually there, obviously, it's just tricked into thinking it. Now, this is what we call a virtual image because the light rays are not actually behind the mirror. However, here's the new concept that we're studying today. If you take this flat mirror and you bend it, now, for those of you who um, maybe remember when they were younger, maybe you went to a carnival or something and they had the, the, the maze of mirrors or the, I don't know what you call it, the fun house of mirrors, whatever, and you know, there's a bunch of curved, curved mirrors, um, and they give you really weird optical illusion patterns. Some make you look fat, some make you look thin, some make you look tall. That's, that's pretty much what we're studying actually right now. So if you take that, that plane mirror and you bend it, specifically if you bend it in the shape of, in the shape of a sphere, so not like a V, not like a, you know, a wavy, just like a sphere, because um, all the math that we're about to do only works for spherical mirrors then you see that all of a sudden um, things become very different. So if, if the mirror itself is bent in a sphere, then the light rays, the light rays are still coming off of point P radially. They're, they're still coming off kind of everywhere, just, just like before. And when they strike here, instead of coming, you know, uh, instead of diverging, striking it and then going away from the mirror, they actually get focused inward. And this is, this is only true for spherical mirrors. If it's a sphere, or, the, or the, the shape of the mirror is a sphere, then these will all focus their, their reflected rays through one specific point. And it's, it's the location at which all of the light rays pinch together, or focus together, that's going to be the location of the image. And this is a, a physical image. Light rays are physically converging together at this point. So if you were to place your eye here, that's where you would see the image. Now, your eye cannot tell the difference between a virtual image and a real image. It's an optical illusion either way. Well, one's an optical illusion. The other one, um, like, like this is an optical illusion. This is not an illusion. However, the whole notion of an illusion is you can't tell the difference. So the, the whole point is with your eye, you can't necessarily tell with your eye that it's going to be a real or imaginary image. And that's why the, 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 the fun house of mirrors is so fun, because you can't tell what's real and what's not. So let's define some new terms. Well, we know that this, if our mirror is bent into the shape of a sphere. So it's not a complete sphere, it's just a, a slice of a sphere. So if we were to complete, if we were to just trace the rest of the sphere here, this is a terrible drawing of a sphere. If we were to just complete the circle, then the circle would inherently have a center and it would have a radius. Okay, so some new terms that we're coining. There is the center of curvature, C. The center of curvature is just the location that is at the center of the circle that the spherical lens would make had the circle been completed. Then we can define R as the radius of curvature. The radius of curvature is the distance be between the center of curvature and the mirror. More simply, it's just the radius of the, cir of the circle that the, the mirror completes. Now, in relation to our sign convention, we said distances, when we represent these physical systems uh, mathematically, we have to represent them with distances, like locations and, and distances. Our sign convention applies to any distance. So our, uh, our radius of curvature is positive 
because uh, we take it to be positive according to our sign convention because the center of curvature is on the same side as the mirror of the reflected light, meaning light is physically traveling through the center of curvature, right? Light, you can see here, light is, is uh, on the same side as a center of curvature. So by the sign convention, if light is passing through it physically, it's taken to be a positive value. When this is the case, we call this a concave, in this case, mirror. Now you could have a concave lens as well, but the lens allows light to pass through it. This is a mirror, it reflects light. So this is what we call concave. Now the reverse is, well, the reverse. It's the exact opposite. So here, if you have the reflecting surface on the outside and the glass part, the glass part, it was the thing, the integrity of it. The glass itself doesn't do the reflecting. It's the shiny, it's a shining coating that we put on the glass. So um, if the reflective surface is on the outside and it curves inward, then you see here that if you were to complete the circle, if you were to complete the circle here, the center of curvature is over here. However, there's no light rays over there. All the light rays are coming in and reflecting on the other side. So there are no light rays on the side of the center of curvature in this case. So according to our sign convention, if light rays do not pass through it, it's negative. We call that negative. So this would have a negative, negative radius of curvature. Whereas this one would, oh, there we go. We have a positive radius of curvature. And this is called a convex, a convex spherical mirror or a convex mirror. We're only going to be dealing with spherical mirrors, really. So if you just say a convex mirror, we know that that means spherical in this class. OK, now. There is a long complicated derivation um, that really is full of geometry for no good reason. So instead of showing you that derivation, because it would really just take time and uh, it, it's not really in the scope of the course. So um, given that this is a sphere, um, again, I cannot stress this enough, spherical mirrors, this is only true for spherical mirrors, uh, well, as well as spherical lenses, as we will find out, but spheres, specifically a sphere, um, given the geometry of this, you can actually derive this relationship. Now, this is using S and S prime. I'm not really a huge fan of S and S prime because, I mean, I know symbols are arbitrary, um, but these symbols are extra arbitrary. They don't really remind you what, what is what. So I like to use, uh, I like to use the following representation. I like instead of saying one over S plus one over S prime equals two over R, I like using one over DO distance of object. And maybe perhaps I should write that down distance of object. And this is going to be oops, distance of image. That's what DO and DI stand for. Um, and that that way it helps it built into the symbology. It helps remind you what what the variables represent. And of course, don't forget that each of these each of these has the sign convention to contend with. So do well do is always positive because light is always coming from the object itself. Otherwise, you wouldn't see it. But di di could either be a positive value or a negative value, depending on whether it's a virtual image or a real image. So please keep that in mind. And um, that's also true for the R value as well, uh, whether it's a convex lens or a concave lens. OK, so we now have an equation to figure out the relationship between where we place our object and where we will see our image, which is uh, really what, what this is all about. Now, let's look mathematically at, some, at this uh, again. Um, if, if, this is a giant if, this is like a, a thought experiment, for instance. If our object was infinitely far away, if our object was infinitely far away, 
If our object was infinitely far away, then that means by the time the light rays reached the mirror, they would be coming in nearly parallel, kind of like the sun. You know, there's, there's light rays coming out from the sun, and the sun is, I mean, I know we can measure the distance of the sun, but, you know, in the context of a small mirror the size of your hand, that distance is effectively infinity far away. So if your object is, is way up here at infinity, then the light rays are coming in parallel. And mathematically, you see here that if DO is, is infinity, then mathematically you're going to get 1 over infinity plus 1 over DI equals 2 over R, which means you're going to get a location of the image to be the radius of curvature over 2. Mathematically, because don't forget basic math, 1 over infinity is equal to 0. And for anyone who is more of a math brain than a physics brain, yes, I'm aware it's the limit is 1 over x as x goes to infinity equals 0 or approaches 0. I don't care about limits. Limits are stupid. So anyway, um, welcome to physics where we butcher math. Basic math, we butcher it. Anyway, so here this is saying, according to the math, that if you have an object infinitely far away, then you're going to have a location of the image at a distance that is r over 2 from the, from the mirror. Now, this is such a special point because if the light rays are coming in parallel, then all the light rays are being focused at that one image. So we call this the focal point. So we are defining a new term here, and we're calling it the focal point. It is the focal point, conceptually, is the location at which incoming parallel light rays will converge. If the light rays do not come in parallel, then they will not go through the focal. So, this is only uh, in reference to incoming parallel light rays. And then everything will be focused into one location. That's called the focal point. And we see here from the math, from the above equation, that mathematically the focal point is going to be half of the radius of curvature. So F equals R over 2. Now, this also provides us with what, what uh, our first ray diagram rule. So when we're, when we're, uh, there's two ways to study um, optics, geometric optics, with mirrors and lenses. One is geometrically using ray diagrams and drawing a diagram on paper. The other way is mathematically. So we would do both just to make sure we got the right answer. We would have the two of them sort of um, corroborate each other. And if we do it geometrically, we need a, a way, a notion, an idea of how to construct uh, our ray diagrams or, or predict where the light is going to go. Rule number one for this, we call this ray diagram rule number one. Quote unquote, in parallel out through the focal. That's the first rule of optics for ray diagrams. This means that if you have a light ray that is coming in and striking the mirror uh, that is parallel, not in at an angle, just parallel to the ground, then it will come out through the focal point. Then it'll come out through the focal point. Okay, so that's ray diagram rule number one. Okay. Now, the opposite is also true. If you have a light source, like let's say, let's say you have a candle, let's say you have a candle and you hold it at the focal point and you put a mirror behind the candle, then you have a bunch of light from the flame emanating from the flame and it emanates radially or a light bulb. Hell, if you, if you want to draw a light bulb, go nuts. Um, if you have a light source, whatever light source you want, I get, I'm stuck in medieval times, um, flame, who uses candles for light anymore? Anyway, um, even, even if there's no, like, like, even if the power goes out, we have like solar panels and, you know, little trinkety solar lights, like no one, no one uses candles anymore. Anyway, um, if you have a light source and you hold out at a focal point, then what happens is the opposite is true. The light is originating from the focal, so it will strike the mirror, having come from the focal point, 
and then it will go out parallel. So this is a way to sort of control scattering. In fact, this phenomenon right here is what we use for stage lighting or a more common uh, term you may have heard is a spotlight or an even more butchering of a term is called the spot. You know, you might have an actor on stage saying, hey, can I get a spot? That means, can I get a spotlight? And what is a spotlight? A spotlight is, is a, a source of light that has a spherical mirror behind it located so the, the source of light is at the focal point of the mirror and then it allows you to focus all of the light rays uh, in, a, in a nice coherent beam so they don't go scattering it doesn't light up the whole room it just lights up a very specific patch um, and it's a spotlight so here um those are the two main ray dot uh, oh sorry yeah um just just to rephrase because i don't think i did that just Thinking back on it, ray diagram rule number two is the reverse. In through the focal, out parallel. So if a ray di if there's a light ray that passes through the focal point and strikes the mirror having passed through the focal point, then it will come out parallel. Okay, so those are the two. Please keep those in the back of your head uh, as we go on in this lecture. Those are the two ray diagram rules that we will be heavily, heavily using. Now, I think the pre-class question from last Thursday tripped some of you up. And last Thursday, today's Wednesday, so that kind of shows you kind of we are we are a little bit behind schedule. Um, people were saying with the magnetism, uh, not magnetism, um, magnification question on the pre-class quiz, um, none of the answers make sense. Well, they do. If you look, one of them said um, it's a ratio of the height of the image compared to the height of the object. That is the correct answer. And a lot of you were confused because you were specifically looking for this equation. You were, oh, that's blue on blue. You were specifically looking for the magnification is the, um, the ratio of the distance of the image to the distance of the object. And this, in fact, is not always true. Now, a lot of first year books will list this as the magnification, but please understand that is not, that's, this is a proxy for magnification. That in a, in a very specific situation, when you have a spherical mirror and it's, and it's in air and air on both sides, or I guess that air and air on both sides is only uh, a problem for lenses. Um, but if, if it's specifically a spherical mirror, then yes, if you have a spherical mirror, you can actually derive this equality between the ratio of the heights and the ratio of the, of the um, distances. And you can do that using similar triangles as illustrated in this slide. Again, the derivation of which I, I don't really want to concern ourselves with, but point being, um, I just want to let you know that the definition of magnetism is not given in the in terms of distances because many things can affect those distances um, you know you could have air on one side and water on the other you could have a parabolic mirror instead of a spherical mirror so like the geometry of what's going on here is different depending what type of, of mirror you have but what what is constant in any situation is that the magnification fundamentally um, just intuitively is given by how big something looks now compared to how big is it actually, right? That's the definition of magnification. Um, now, again, this, this book is using Y prime and Y and S prime and S. I don't really like doing that. So uh, here's my rendition of this. So the magnification equals height of the image divided by height of the object also equals height, uh, distance of the image divided by distance of the object with a negative sign. And this equation will be on the formula sheet for the exam. It's a pretty fundamental equation. However, it's time consuming to like always reference the, the um, formula sheet and you know, trying to search to figure out what equation you need. Here's a sort of saying, and I, I usually I'm against these sayings, but this one's kind of cute. 
Um, for those of you who are familiar with Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, um, the movie, that you will you you might remember a song in the movie when the dwarves are kind of marching off to work, where they say "Hi ho, hi ho, off to work we go." This is very similar. It's let me just change my color here. It's hi ho die do with a negative sign you know, which is very similar to hi ho hi ho it's off to work we go. Hi ho die do with a negative sign you know. So if you're always needing to kind of use this equation, you can never remember, you know, wh where the negative sign goes or what goes on the top, what goes on the bottom. Just remember the saying, hi ho die do with a negative sign you know. And if you can't remember that, then maybe just try to remember Snow White and the Seven Dwarves and then maybe the, the lyrics will come to you. Uh, okay, the other thing I wanna say before moving on to the next slide is let's practice. Now this slide here does not use the ray diagram rules, but let's practice using the ray diagram rules. Um, let me, is there a way I can insert a shape? Yes, there is. Let me see if I can cover this. Is there a way? I can fill this, I don't know. Okay, I don't know. Let me, I, I can't even color it with white. Okay, let's see here. I'm just gonna try to color this in so it's not so intrusive. It's weird coloring with white. It's like those white crayons when you buy a box of Crayola crayons and uh, they give you that white crayon. You're like, when am I ever gonna use this? I guess in times like this. Okay, that's good enough, I think. So here, let's use our ray diagrams. So our ray diagram rule number one says in parallel out through the focal. So we would go in parallel, in parallel. Now you might be thinking, but Mark, there's no light ray there. Don't forget, light rays are emanated radially, everywhere. We're only drawing two of the infinitely many light rays that are coming off of this object. So if I go out parallel, sorry, if I come in parallel, I need to go out through the focal. Now, this is the center of curvature here. We know from before the focal point is gonna be halfway between the uh, mirror and the center of curvature. So the focal point will be right around here. So in parallel, out through the focal. So let me try to aim freehand, aim through the focal. Okay, so they, oh boy. There's the first light ray. Now the second light ray is in through the focal and out parallel. So the second light ray, let's make that one green. I aim for the focal point. Okay, and it strikes, it strikes the mirror. Now, as far as the mirror is concerned, the mirror can't tell that the light ray originated before the focal point. All the mirror can, can sense, I mean, the, the mirror is inanimate, so it can't sense anything really, but you know, pretend, pretend you, know, you are the mirror. All you know is that the light ray is coming in along the same line as the focal point. So mathematically, it's, it's as if it's coming in originating from the focal point. It's coming in along the same direction as the focal point. So it would then come out parallel. Okay, now ultimately, you see if you allow enough space to go by, these rays diverge ultimately, right? You've got the green ray that goes out over here and the black ray that comes out over here and they're spreading out. So ultimately, you're not gonna be able to see this image anywhere or, or everywhere. However, there is one very specific location in space where these two light rays come together again. And that's where they meet. That's where the black and the green meet. That is where the image is gonna be formed. Now, what does this mean? Well, we were drawing the light rays from the top of this arrow, which means when the, two, when the green and the black light rays come together, that's gonna to be the location of the top of the arrow. So 
uh, in this case, the top of the arrow is going to be right there. And as you can see here, the diagram says image. The image is going to have a, a tinier arrow upside down. And we know it's upside down because the, the intersection of the green and the black light rays are below the x-axis. So the top of the arrow is actually below the x-axis. So th in this case, this is going to be inverted. Now, relating this back to magnification and such, um, this is going to be the height of the object. This is going to be the height of the image. Now, the height of the image, again, on your x, y axis, the height of the image, hi, is below, below the x axis. So it, inherently, it will be a negative value when you solve for it. So if you want to calculate the magnification, you would plug in hi divided by ho. And you're going to, in this case, you're going to get a negative number. Now, in addition to it being negative, you're also going to get a, a number that's less than one. Because you can see here that the original object is much larger than the image. The image is smaller. So the mag magnification is less than one. It didn't get bigger, it got smaller. And not only is it less than one, it'll be negative because it's upside down, it's inverted. So the, the absolute value of the magnification will be less than one and the value of magnification itself will be negative. Now, in terms of di and do, di, sorry, do is positive, obviously. Do is the, um, the, the location of the object relative to the mirror. Now, di, di is going to be positive if the light rays are physically traveling through the location of the image and negative otherwise. In this case, the green and the black rays are physically passing through the location of the image. So di is taken to be positive. Now, as you can see here, di from the diagram is obviously less than do. So the ratio of do, uh, sorry, di over do is going to be less than one inherently. You can see that from, from the diagram. Now, we know just based on basic definitions of magnification, hi divided by ho will be negative because hi is negative. So that's why we have a negative sign here. Because in the event that we have a real image, di is positive and do is positive, so the ratio is going to be positive. So we add a negative sign here to make sure left side will equal right side. So we know this will be positive. So we, uh, so we add a negative sign. to, oh boy, what's happening down there? To get a negative value. Okay, so that's a little bit of insight to ray diagrams, how you can set up your ray diagram and uh, analyze it using, you know, DI, DO, HI, HO. Okay, with all that in mind, let's do a conceptual example. So there is an apple in real life well, quote unquote real life, um, hanging beyond the center of curvature. Here's the center of curvature. So that makes the focal point, I don't know, somewhere here. And um, there are three people. One, two, three people. Now, I don't know, maybe they're like sitting on top of one another. I don't know how their eyes can all be just lined up. I don't know, no idea, but that aside, um, each student, is uh, trying to describe where they see the apple. You know, so for instance, um, someone claims that the image of the apple is at position one. So uh, Chandra says, okay, I, I'm claiming that I'm seeing the apple at position one. Are they telling the truth? Um, someone else thinks that, um, Wait, what's happening? Oh, sorry, Joe. Joe says he sees it at position two. So Joe is actually seeing the apple here. And the last student thinks, well, you're both, you're both crazy. I, 
you're you're crazy. Um, I I see at position three. Now we have to use physics to figure out which which scenario is true. Maybe they're all true, right? Maybe depending where you are, you see it in different spots. So first of all, let's think of the physics here. What kind of image are we getting? Because if it's an optical illusion, if it's a virtual image, then the location of the image is all about where your eye perceives the, or the original source of the light. It's an optical illusion, right? So presumably, if it's a virtual image, maybe it's understandable, maybe, that depending where you are, you might see it differently. However, if it's a real image, it's not an optical illusion. If it's a real image, the light rays are physically in, in space passing through uh, and, and, and being focused at the location of the image. So that's not a function of where you look or, or where you stand. That's, that's an absolute fact that is not disputable. So let's figure out, do we have a virtual image or a real image? Well, we have the apple that is, um, you know, upright where we have it, you know, just like in the previous question. So let's, let's draw a ray diagram. Um, a ray coming from the top of the apple. So let's maybe I'll change my color away from green. Maybe I'll use um, blue. So a light ray coming from the top of the apple will come in parallel. Okay, and then it'll come out through the focal point. Okay, and then I will draw a, a second ray and it goes in through the focal and out parallel. So again from the top of the apple. Let's go in through the focal and then out parallel. Is there a location where both of these rays intersect? Yes, you can see it right here. So the top of the apple is now going to be below the x axis, and the height of the apple is going to appear smaller than before. So we are going to be in a situation where m is negative and less than 1. It's, it's not magnified, it has shrunk, and it is inverted. So I'm going to say smaller and inverted. So um, location 1 has to be wrong, location 2 has to be wrong, because we see here that there has to be a real image. And if there's a real image, the light rays are physically coming together and physically making an image at position 3. There is no way, if you look from a different angle, it's going to be in a different spot, because this is not an optical illusion. This is where the image physically is. So um, I guess in the context of the question, the third student was correct. The third student says, you're both lying. Um, we all actually, in fact, see it at location three. And uh, that's, that's indeed the right answer here. Now, let's do something a little harder. Instead of conceptually, let's do a rigorous problem. And I, when I say rigorous, I don't mean hard. I just mean um, drawing the ray diagram as well as doing the math. OK, so here. Um, what's the question? A lamp is placed 10 centimeters in front of a concave spherical mirror that forms an image of the filament on a screen that is placed three meters in front of the mirror. So behind, uh, behind, the, behind the filament. Okay. What is the radius of curvature of the mirror? If the, uh, if the lamp, oh, that's part B. Okay. So let's do part A. Part A says, what is, what is R? OK, well, um, in order to analyze this mathematically, I would first recommend drawing, uh, instead of a free body diagram, because it's not forces, um, drawing a ray diagram. And then instead of doing F net equals MA, I would recommend doing the only equation that we have in this chapter. Well, I guess there's two. There's magnification, and then there's the um, spherical spherical mirror equation that we saw earlier. So um, first, let's draw, let's kind of draw um, a situation here. So here's my mirror. Okay. 
So here we go. Now, presumably we have some options here. So context is very important. We don't know where the radius of curvature is and, and thus we don't really know, um, we don't really know where the, where the focal point is, but we do know where the location of the image is. We know the location of the image is um, upside down. We can tell from the diagram, it's upside down and way over here. Okay. Now that's important because in all of the examples we did before, we assumed that the image was in front of us. Now that's, or more, more specifically, we assumed that the focal point was in front of us. That's not a guarantee. You could easily put an object in front of the focal point. What's that going to mean? Well, this is what that's going to mean. So we know that this is true. Um, let's see, let's see if we can analyze this um, using our ray diagrams. So we know because, because the image is behind us, let me say because uh, image, image is behind object, we know focal is behind, oop, focal is behind object uh, as well. So, or close to it. Now here, um, if we look at our thin lens equation or our spherical, spherical lens equation, uh, we know one over DO plus one over DI is gonna equal two over R. Okay, so we ask ourselves, um, what is DO? Okay, well DO, if you read the question, DO was, distance of the object, you place the object 10 centimeters in front of the mirror. So 10 centimeters. All right. And uh, here we see the screen where the image is placed on the screen and the image is formed three meters away from the mirror. Now again, we ask ourselves, are the light rays physically hitting the screen? Yes. That's why a screen is put there. Light hits the screen and, it, I mean, it's, it's literally like a projector screen. You know, when you're in class and the big white projector comes down on the blackboard, um, that is a real image that, that you need a screen to see. So um, real image, according to our sign convention, it's a positive value. So then that means our DI is going to be um, three meters, which is 300 centimeters. You can either put everything in meters or you can put everything in centimeters. It doesn't matter as long as you're consistent. Now, if you plug everything in, you're going to get 1 over 10 plus 1 over 300 equals 2 over R. Now, if you solve for R, you're going to get, let's see here, R over 2 is going to equal um, 300 plus 10 over 3,000, I think, if I did that right. Yes. So you're going to get 310 over 3,000 times 2. So this is, means R is going to equal 310 over 1,500. That doesn't seem right. That should, this should give you something very close, just under 10 is what this should give you. That gives you not something just under 10. Let's see here, 300 over 300. Oh, okay. I guess I, I only needed to multiply this by 30 if I really wanted to. I went over. Now, what I did should have been right, but let's let's do this instead. Oh, I, I flipped and I, I did two things at once and I shouldn't have. That's what I was doing. 
okay, 31 over 300. So that makes R over two equal to 300 over 31. Yeah, I was, I only flipped one of the two sides. Whew. Rookie mistake, rookie mistake. Okay, so um, this is gonna be 600 over 31, and that's gonna be just, uh, no, yeah, that's gonna be around what? Around 10, it'll be around, okay, whatever, the answer here is saying, yeah, around 19, 19.4 centimeters. So whatever, if you had a calculator, you could say 20. 600 over 30, they're on 20, so whatever. Okay, so the radius of curvature is 20, which means your focal point is half of 20. It'll be around 10-ish. So we placed, um, well, we, yeah, this, this location is at 10 centimeters, um, which is right close to the focal point, as it, as it turns out, right close. In fact, the focal point, I think, mathematically is like, you know, right, right there, really close. Anyway, um, so there's a radius of curvature. Um, part B, if the lamp filament is known to be five millimeters tall, how tall is its image known to be? Okay, well, we're talking about magnification now. So height of the image over height of the object equals minus di over do. Well, we know di, di was what, 300? And um, do, uh, I already forgot, do was 10. So this is gonna be 300 over 10 is 30, and the negative sign, so negative 30. Now, negative means the image is inverted. 30 means it is 30 times larger than the, the object itself. So here, we know the magnification is 30, or minus 30, so then that means the height of the image is going to equal negative 30 times the height of the object, and the height of the object was, what did they say, the height of the, oh, sorry, it's a reverse. We have the height of the image, sorry. We have the, so we had to solve for HO. Um, so HO equals um, H, eh, HI over M, which is going to be five meters, millimeters, what is it, Meter, uh, millimeters, five millimeters over minus 30. And when you do that math, um, you're going to get something uh, pretty small. Hmm. Where I don't see where the answer is at the moment. Do they not have the answer? Oh, wait. How tall? Oh, no, sorry, I did have that right the first time. I should learn how to read. They want the height of the image, sorry. So they do want the height of the image. So that means it's just gonna be simply uh, M times HO. So it's gonna be minus 30 times, and the height of the filament is five millimeters. Okay, sorry, we did have that. I did have that right the first time. Okay, so um, your answer is just five times 30, which is uh, 150 millimeters, negative. So the fact that it's negative means negative means inverted and um, got a height of 150 millimeters. And 150 millimeters is about 15 centimeters upside down because of the negative sign. Okay. Um, there is another worked example here, but this one has a full solution. So if we have time, we'll come back to it later. Um, if not, I would definitely recommend that you carve out some time and review this yourself. But again, if we have time, we'll come back. Um, the next thing is concave, sorry, convex mirrors. They're very similar. They're just opposite. 
Everything's the same, but opposite. It's the same equation. Same equation. Now, actually, that being said, we know the focal point is half the radius. So you can actually just say one over F if you prefer um, their equivalent. Um, same equation, because it's still a spherical mirror and all of this geometry and this math all applies to spherical things. And it's the same definition for magnification as we had before. Oops. So same two equations. The only difference is the sign convention is now a little bit different. The sign convention now, the radius of curvature and the, thus the focal point for a convex mirror will be negative. So I will say um, the difference being the focal point is negative, the radius of curvature is negative, and um, the distance of the image is going to be virtual. So um, it will be negative as well. So mathematically, the only real difference is, is the sign convention. Now, uh, the ray diagrams are pretty much the same. Not, they're not too different. Um, so here, here is the, um, uh, the rules for the ray diagrams of, of a convex mirror. So if the rays come in parallel, before we said in parallel out through the focal, but here they don't, ref they don't reflect through the focal, they reflect away from the focal. So if they come in parallel, they reflect as if they're, they're coming from the focal. So it's still sort of the same, it's still sort of in through the, in parallel out through the focal, sort of. It's just kind of different. Very similar though, in parallel out as if it's going away from the focal. Okay, um, and then the reverse is true. If, if you have a light ray that happens to be coming in that is aimed at the hidden focal point on the other side, then it will reflect and it will go out parallel. So the same two ray diagrams, uh, sorry, the same two ray diagram rules are, are effectively unchanged in this situation as well. You just kind of have to know to trace back. So here's, a, here's an example of how we might do that. So a convex mirror has a known radius of curvature of 10, centimeter, uh, 10 centimeters. Now, every word in a physics problem is crucial. We are told ahead of time it's a convex mirror. The reason this is important is because that tells us, according to our sign convention, that our R value is going to be negative. Okay. Uh, calculate the location and size of the image. So they want to know the location and size of the image uh, formed from an eight millimeter tall object uh, whose distance from the mirror is some things. So we'll say, we'll just start off with, um, let's say 15 centimeters. Then there's 10, to, if you can do one, you can do the other ones fairly easy. Okay, so I've listed my givens and now we just have to do the math. So we go to our equation, one over DO plus one over DI equals two over R. That's our spherical mirror equation that we saw earlier. So this is just a simple plug and chug. 1 over d, uh, oh sorry, this should be do, not di, do. Uh, 1 over do, so 1 over 15 plus 1 over di equals 2 over negative 10. So 2 over negative 10 is simply, um, let's here, minus 1 over 5. So let's solve for di. Oops, squiggly, I don't know why it does that. Di, okay. And combining fractions, three, three. So this is gonna be, let's see here, four 
over 15 equals one over di. So this is gonna be di equals 15 over four. 15 over four is gonna be just bigger than 15 over five, which is three. So this is gonna be just, just, bigger, than, just bigger than three. So um, I'll say this is gonna be bigger than three. And what was my unit for 15? 15 centimeters. So this is gonna be just bigger than three centimeters. Um, it'll actually be somewhere around three and a half, maybe, maybe closer to four because 16 over four is four. So it'll probably be closer to four actually, come to think of it. Uh, well, actually 12, it's gonna be 12 and three, 12 over four, yeah. This is gonna be 12 over four plus three over four. So it, actually this is gonna be 3.75 centimeters. It's gonna be exactly 3.75 centimeters. Yep, and that's what, um, that's what they're getting here. Now they're getting, a, did I miss a negative sign somewhere? They're getting a negative value. Mm. Oh yes, I am missing a negative sign somewhere. I, uh, oops, when I brought this over, I forgot to make that negative. So that should have been a negative, which makes this negative, which makes this negative, which makes this negative, which makes this negative. Okay. See, so the, the bane of your existence in this chapter is going to be the stupid sign convention. Um, it happens to the best of us. It doesn't mean we're, we're bad at optics. It just means, um, <laughs> it just means they're, they, they get messy sometimes. Um, so that's how you do an example with a con, convex uh, mirror. Now, let's just for fun, the, the other ones are fairly easy to do as well. I don't want to do B and C and D because like it's just same math, different numbers. Um, however, let's see if we can draw a ray diagram just to sort of solidify what's going on here. Okay, so here is this. Now, what's, what's going on? I've got the distance of the object. So I've got the radius of curvature to be 10. So let's call this R. Um, the focal point is going to be here at 5. This is going to be 10. Where do I have my object? I've got my object at 15. So I've got my object here at 15. Now, I, I don't really care about the height. Um, we just use magnification for the height. It's fairly easy. Um, so let's draw our ray diagram. So the focal point, um, the real focal point is actually going to be over here. So this is going to be the focal point. And this is going to be um, R. Okay, so two, uh, there's two ray diagram rules. In parallel, out through the supposed focal. So let's do that. In parallel. Okay, and then out through the supposed focal. Okay, just like that and then in through the focal, out parallel. So in through the focal, um, I need, this is hilarious, I am using a ruler on a touch screen. That's funny. So I'm aiming for, oh, come on. You can tell drawing is not my forte. All right, that's, that's as good as we're going to get it, folks. Um, so it goes in, uh, in as if it's aiming for the focal, but then it comes out, it comes out parallel. Okay, and then what you do is you trace, again, it's an optical illusion, you trace these things backwards, and where they meet is where you're going to have your image. So you're going to have your image somewhere here. Now we solved for di, the distance of the image, and we got 3.75, negative 3.75 centimeters. Negative means it's a virtual image. Virtual meaning the light rays are not physically passing through the location of the image. Does this make sense with our ray diagram? Yes, it does. Because we see here that we had to trace the, the, um, the rays backwards. And if we were to look at it here with our eyes, 
then our eyes would perceive be tricked illusion. It would, it would perceive that this object uh, is, is over here, which would be the virtual image. So our answer seems to make sense with our ray diagram. Now, the value is 3.75. What is the value of our focal? Well, the, the radius of curvature is 10. The focal is 5, which means this is going to be negative 5. This is going to be negative 10. And we're, we are in a ray diagram. We're getting a location just, oh boy, just to the left of the focal. So just to the left of focal means slightly, slightly less negative than negative five. So it could have been negative four, it could have been negative three. Like ray diagrams are not precise necessarily. Um, they're just a way for you to confirm your numerical result to make sure you did your numerical result correctly. Now this looks like we did because just to the left of negative five would be negative 3.75. So everything seems to fit. The ray diagram corroborates our mathematical answer. Okay, um, here is another example. Um, again, a lot of these relate to swimming and fishing. Um, you, might, you might see warning signs on pools. And I mean, often there's, there's always at least like one lifeguard in, uh, in the bunch. Now, how many, how many students are here in the moment? There's not that many. Um, I don't know if any of the, out of the people here, I don't know if any of you are a lifeguard, but on most pools, they will say, you know, caution, water, water is more shallow than it appears. You know, and you're like, oh yeah, that's deep enough. I can do a pencil dive. You know, you can just jump in with straight, straight body, heels first, locking your knees. And that's a great way to break, break an ankle or break a leg. Because if the water is more shallow than the depth of your body, you can collide with the floor and obviously you're, very badly hurt yourself. So why, why is this being said? It's an optical illusion. So for instance, um, you know, here, if you have a plane surface, really a plane surface is, is a special case of a sphere. It's a sphere with an infinitely uh, large radius. So if you have a plane surface, like the, the pool surface, you can set R to be infinity. And uh, when you, when you uh, substitute in that math, you end up getting um, a, a perceived depth. You can see mathematically that your perceived depth is going to be um, shallower than the real depth. And that's, that's bad. Um, that means you think uh, it's, well, I don't know, that means that you think it'll be deeper and it's deeper than it looks, actually come to think of it. The perceived depth is less than what it actually is. So yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe there's being safe at pools to just warn you to it's the shallow end, don't dive in or something. But yeah, point being, um, water, water is, is, is a type of lens and it can refract and uh, it, can, it can act like a lens in that sense. And you have to be very cognizant that the light rays that you're seeing within the water have been a result of having been bent by the water and thus acting like um, a lens. So it's really important you kind of really internalize what you're seeing um, either in a mirror or, or in, um, in water. Now, we're gonna move on to lenses. Now, spoiler, we're gonna move very fast through lenses because they're exactly the same as spherical mirrors, uh, just opposite, the same but opposite. Um, and you, that, that'll make more sense to you momentarily. The main difference between a lens, the main difference between a lens and mirror is mirror reflects light and a lens refracts light. Meaning a mirror will reflect light back at you. So if the light is coming in on the left, it will be reflected back on the left. A lens is typically made out of glass or plastic and that's see-through. So light, when it strikes the, the lens or glass or plastic, um, it will go through 
the lens. It will get transmitted into the lens and it's a new medium. So then refraction kicks in and it will bend and then and then that's how you can manipulate the, the direction of the light rays. So that's the only fundamental difference between a mirror and a lens. One will reflect, the other will refract. Now, you might think to yourself, this is gonna get confusing because now that it refracts, then it matters what kind of glass, it matters the index of refraction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In real life, you're not wrong. However, there's a caveat we can actually do a very good approximation uh, of, of where the image will be in the math uh, and ignore the index of refraction and assuming some things. So I will say to maybe in a different color to avoid needing knowledge of n, you know, now that, now that we are refracting light, um, we can get around this. And it's a complete fluke, by the way, that we can get around this. There's nothing in, in, in the laws of nature that says this, this should be true. Um, it's just a fluke that it is true. We can get around needing knowledge of the index of refraction by creating a very thin lens. And I, I, I mean that quite literally. It's so thin that the thickness of the lens is, is uh, quite minuscule. What do I mean by that? I mean, you do not have a thick piece of glass that you've carved to be a lens. That is not a thin lens anymore. I mean, you have a thin piece of, of, of glass where, you know, the tips of them, you know, like for instance, let me just draw a picture. This would not be a thin lens. Okay, although, although this is spherical, or at least it was supposed to be spherical, okay, although this, the two sides are both spherical, you see here that it's got a thick width. There's sort of like a, a, a section on the top. Um, but if you have something like this, this is a thin lens. Okay, and it's still spherical. Still, still spherical. Okay, so if, if we can construct a lens that is considered to be thin, which is all we're going to be talking about in this class, so relax, um, then you can actually approximate the real complicated equation by dropping all the n values, and then miraculously, we actually end up getting we end up getting the same equation. As we had with mirrors. And please understand that this is an approximation. Now it's a really good approximation for thin lenses. Like it's so good that like even in real life when they make your prescription glasses and they make your contact lenses, they still use the thin lens equation because that's how good of an approximation it is. But in real life, um, this is a simplification of a more complicated equation that is, is simplified by the fact that this delta x effectively goes to zero. And when that goes to zero, um, it simplifies the real complicated equation quite nicely. So it's a fluke, but luckily for us, it's true that the analysis method for a lens is identical, identical to that of a mirror, as long as it's spherical. And in this class, we're all we're going to be talking about is sphere. Okay, so um, just to reiterate, but in context of a lens now. So we had, oop, what happened? Okay, here we go. Um, we still had the two ray diagrams. 
We had um, in parallel, out through the focal, in through the focal, out parallel. That's still true, right? Because all the same math applies. It's still a sphere. It's the same thin lens equation, I fluke, and it's got the same governing uh, mag um, uh, magnetism, not magnetism, magnification equation. So because all of the, the analysis equations are the same, all of the, all of the conceptual rules are also the same. So, you know, if you have the sun over here and you have parallel shining light rays coming in to a lens, then they will go out and uh, focus at one spot. So I don't know, maybe if you grew up on a farm or if you were just a mean kid, I don't know, and you, you had a magnifying glass, you know, you can like quote unquote burn ants. Um, I sincerely hope no one's ever done that. That's very cruel. But you know, you can hold the magnifying glass up, up, you know, to a sunbeam, and it will focus the rays of light in one spot. And uh, that's a lot of heat all in one spot. And you can presumably, if it's a strong enough day and, and uh, a strong enough um, magnifying glass, you can presumably start a fire. You know, if it's uh, something easily flammable like some paper or some kindling, hopefully not an ant, but you know, technically possible. And the reverse is true as well. If you have a, um, a light source at the focal point and you send the light, um, you know, through a, um, a converging lens, then it will come out parallel, just like with the mirror, you know, in through the focal, out parallel. And here in parallel, out through the focal. So the same two uh, rules apply. The sign convention is also true. So the sign convention, again, if the light rays physically pass through the image, it's a positive distance. If the light rays do not physically pass through the image, it's a negative or, or a virtual. So um, this, this slide is just reiterating for you that it's the same equations as before, which I've already mentioned. Um, now, that's pretty much all, all there is to know about um, a converging lens. And I, I say that as if it's nothing. It's not nothing. It's just we've already talked about it. We've already talked about it with this is analogous to um, this is a convex lens is going to be equivalent to a concave mirror in that they are both converging. Okay. Um, we can have a diverging lens and a diverging lens is called a concave lens because here you see it's like a cave. It's beveled inwards. So it's a concave lens and this is going to be a diverging lens. Now the same rules apply as we had before. Um, before we had um, a convex mirror was a diverging mirror. So a, a concave lens is equivalent to a convex mirror. Okay, so that's what I said. They're the same but opposite. Now, now that we know it's diverging, oh, right, um, in that they are both diverging. Okay, now that we know that they're both diverging, the same rules, uh, ray diagram rules apply. We come in parallel and they go out as if they go out having come from the focal. In parallel, out through the focal. And the reverse is true. You know, um, is there, yeah, here the reverse is true. If there was, oops, if there was a light ray coming in, that was apparently, again, optical illusion, apparently aimed for the focal, then it would be refracted and bent and it would emerge on the other side, all of them coming out parallel. And again, you might be thinking to yourself, Mark, it depends what kind of glass you make it out of. Flint glass, regular glass, ice, water, they all have different indices of refraction. You're not wrong. The, the amount of bending is definitely a function of, of material. But again, I will remind you that um, if the lens is thin enough, 
then you can approximate it uh, with, you can approximate the equations without needing uh, anything to do with, with n values. And that is not generically true. If you have a larger lens that is not thin, things get a little bit more messy and then the end values start coming into play again and then the equations become very messy. So this is an approximation that we are doing here. It just happens to be a very good one. So um, here we are. Now this end value here is um, we, we generally don't need it in this class. If you're taking a third year optics class, we will we'll, we'll start reintroducing um, these n values. This happens here for um, what we call, um, well, there's two different kinds of them, but uh, for when the lens has two different um, radi radi radii, radi di, dii, dii, I think, I don't know, I'm not an English major, dii of curvature. And that's, that's evidenced here in the equation. Now, we won't be talking about that in this class. We will only ever be talking about something called the double convex lens. Double convex means that the radius of each side is equal to each other. Okay, now in real life, this isn't true. Um, if you have eyeglasses, um, hell, with eyeglasses, that's not even true on the same side. You have something called bifocals. Bifocals means you have a different radius of curvature at the bottom part of your glass uh, compared to the top part of your glass. So, um, you know, in real life, the, these equations get a little bit messy, but the equation you're seeing here is for when the radius of curvature is different on, on either side. And that's just simply not what we're going to be dealing with here. So um, anyway, in this class, you can focus on, simply you can focus on the left-hand side of this equation here. And this is going to be true for both um, converging lenses, which we call convex lenses, and it's also going to be true for diverging lenses. And again, we're not going to be in red here, I'm going to cross out. We're not going to be talking about these types of lenses. We are only going to be talking about, oh, that was meant to be in red. Uh, oops, we are not going to be talking about meniscus or plano convex or plano concave. We're only going to be talking about the double convex and the double, double concave. And that's just the, the two, the one example from each case that we have for a converging and a diverging lens. And both of which are analyzed using the thin lens maybe in green, thin lens equation. That's one over, oh boy, that's one over DO plus one over DI equals one over F. Or if you prefer two over R, whatever, whatever you prefer. Okay, um, this is a derivation. I included it here in case you cared. I don't care, and I will tell you right now up front, I will never test you on the derivation of, of such a geometric um, derivation. It's just not something I care to know. Um, also, this kind of explains how you get the, the index of refractions that simplify out and cancel out, but again, not something I want to dwell on. Um, okay, this is just saying that a converging lens, this is relating back to relating back to the sign convention that we were talking about earlier. Um, a, a converging lens, or what we call a, um, a convex lens, will have a positive focal length. Why does it have a positive focal length? Well, because if it forms an image, you see here that the light rays bend through and the light rays are physically passing through where the image would be formed. 
So according to our sign convention, if light rays pass through it, it's positive. So this will have a positive S prime or a positive DI value. Um, it'll have a positive focal point, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, here is an example of, of uh, con, uh, convex. Uh, actually, is this? Oh, this is, uh, <laughs> that's funny. So this, this, this here is, is, will end up being a diverging lens, I'll tell you right now. Uh, okay, so here, yeah, the, the focal length of a converging lens is positive. And I will also say here that the, the opposite is true for a diverging lens. So a diverging lens would be the concave lens or the double concave lens, but we just call it the concave lens. It's a diverging lens and it will have a negative focal. So here, if we read this example, and yes, I know the solution is like right on the slide, but let's just go through it anyway. The figure shows an object and its image that are formed by a thin lens. Okay, so this is important. It's telling us there's a thin lens, so we can use the simplified equation. Um, we are being told information about the locations of both the image and the object. We're told about the heights of the image and the, and the object. So all of these are, are important pieces of information. And then question A, they're saying, what is the focal length of the lens? And uh, use your information from the focal point to infer what type of lens it is, either a converging or a diverging lens. And then uh, what is the height of the image? Um, is it real or virtual? So let's, let's um, calculate, well, let's just write down what we have. So we have the height, and eh, maybe not in red, height of the object we have as what, 6.5 millimeters. Uh, we have the distance of the object to be five, six, seven, eight centimeters. We have the distance of the image to be three centimeters. And that's it. And presumably they're asking for the height of the image and they're asking for the focal point of the lens. All right, so um, we only have two equations in this entire chapter, so we may as well write one of them down. All right, so there's the thin lens equation or the spherical mirror equation. They're the same equation. And um, we're asked for a focal point. Okay, so if we're asked for focal point, maybe it would be wise to not have it in terms of R. Maybe we can swap it in terms of the focal point. Tomato, tomato, it really depends what they're asking for. So, uh, okay, we have, we have DO, we have DI, we're looking for F. Seems pretty straightforward to me. So um, here, here we, oh, sorry. There's one other thing, one other thing we need. Um, this, this needs some, um, this, this needs some attention. So um, the sign of S prime will determine whether it's a virtual image or a real image, all right? So here, if you look, if you look, um, cause we don't know, we don't know if the light rays are passing through it or not, cause we don't know if it's a, a diverging lens or a converging lens, okay? So we don't know, we don't know how to impose the sign convention here, cause we don't know where, if this is a converging lens or, or a diverging lens. So we don't know how to trace the rays yet. So we need another piece of information. If you look at the magnification equation, um, height of the image over height of the object equals minus di over do. Well, if you look here, what we do know from the picture, we don't know the exact value of the height of the image, but we see in the, in the diagram here that the image is erect and the object is erect. So we know that HI is positive, we know HO is positive, so we know the magnification is going to be positive, which means this is going to equal a positive value. 
Okay. Now the distance of the object is always positive because the light rays are always emanating from, from the object. So that can't ever be negative. But here we have negative times something divided by a positive equals a positive. So that tells me that this must be negative because negative times a negative will be a positive and then a positive over a positive will be positive. So looking at the magnification equation, it tells us that this has to be negative mathematically. And the, the mere fact that this is a, a negative mathematically immediately tells me this is a diverging image or sorry, a diverging lens. Okay. So the image is virtual because the sign convention says it's negative when the light rays do not physically pass through it. So this image is an optical illusion. Optical, that's not how you spell illusion. Optical illusion. Okay, so now that we have everything, now we plug it in. So uh, one over DO, DO is eight, plus one over negative three is gonna equal to one over F. Let's solve for F. So this is gonna be, um, well, I can cross multiply if you want. This is gonna be three over three, eight over eight. So eight, nine, 10, 11 over minus 24 equals one over F, which tells me F is gonna equal minus 24 over 11. 24 over 11, well, there's 24 over 10 is around 2.4. Um, so did I, oh, hold on, I did that wrong. This should be negative eight. No, nah. okay, so this should be negative eight plus three, which is what, five, negative five over, 24, there we go. So this is gonna be 24 over five. Okay, there we go, 24 over five. 25 over five is um, close to five. So we don't have 25 over five, we've got 24 over five. So this is gonna be slightly less than five, oops, slightly less than, well, five centimeters and negative. So um, four point something negative. So the answer, oh, looks like the answer here is negative 4.8, so. I guess if you had a calculator, you'd say it was minus 4.8 centimeters. So again, this is twice now that you've, that you've even seen me get tripped up by the negative sign. Now, how did I know I got tripped up by the negative sign? By using a sanity check. I knew that it didn't fit with, with what the answers should have been. So like logically. So I strongly recommend having sanity checks um, that you perform to help catch these stupid plus minus mistakes. Um, I am very, very notorious for these plus minus mistakes. So, um, and it's, maybe you guys won't be, I don't know, but um, historically, if, if, if there's something that is so nitpicky that, you know, even a, someone who's well-versed and does this frequently messes up because it's so nitpicky, um, it's something that you should definitely not take, take light. It would, when you're doing practice problems, um, please make sure you're, you're, you're getting these plus and minus signs correct. Um, okay, what else are they looking for? So that was A. What is, what, is the, um, what is the focal length? So the focal length was minus 4.8. The, the mere fact that it's negative means by the sign convention means it's a diverging lens. And um, B, what is the height of the image? Is it real or virtual? So B is what's the height of the image. So the magnification equals HI over HO equals minus DI over DO. So the height of the image is going to be minus di over do times ho. So this is going to be what three divided by eight, or it's going to be negative of negative three over eight times ho. What's ho? Six point five. Six point five millimeters. So three over eight. Um, times 6.5. So it's going to be, I don't know, two and a half. It's going to be around two and a half. 
around. Use a calculator. It's going to be around two and a half millimeters, I think. Uh, yeah, right there, 2.44 millimeters. Okay. Um, here, this is an example of um, a diverging lens that has two different radii of, of curvature on either side. And I promised you that we will not be doing these. So um, I've included an example in here just for your reference, but you will not have one on an assignment, hopefully, um, at least not, a, not the ones that I make. And if you get one on the multiple choice, just let me know. Don't answer it. Just let me know and I'll, I'll delete it. But um, we're, we're not covering that in this class, just because of time constraints. So here's a brief summary of all the ray diagrams uh, that you could possibly have for a for a uh, converging lens. So scenario one, you have an, uh, an object that is beyond the focal point and you have in parallel out through the focal and then you have in through the focal out parallel and you see here that the object, sorry, the object, the image is inverted and smaller and real B, you have the object that is now slightly closer to the focal. We're getting closer and closer and closer to the focal. Um, again, in parallel, out through the focal, in through the focal, out parallel. And you see here that the image is a little bit bigger than it used to be. And it's getting a little bit closer to the focal. Sorry, it, no, it's, it's getting a little bit farther away from the focal. And then again, we get even closer to the focal. So if we, if we shrink this distance even more, then we get even farther away from the focal and we get even bigger. So this is showing you that as you get closer to the focal point, your image is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's still real, it's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and farther and farther away. And then finally, when you are at the focal point, you don't have an image at all. Meaning, if you're at the focal point, your image is infinitely far away. Now, how do you rectify this in your head? Look at the equation. 1 over DO plus 1 over DI equals 1 over focal. If, hypothetically, you place DO at the focal point, then your equation becomes 1 over F plus 1 over DI equals 1 over F cancel, cancel, and you end up getting 1 over di equals 0, and that means you're going to end up getting di equals 1 over 0, which is infinity, which means your image is an infinitely far distance away. What does it mean to have a, uh, an image infinitely far away? It means you don't have an image. There is no image. It's not real. It's not virtual. It just means you have no image. So not, not real, not virtual just non-existent. Okay. Now let's push the limits. If we go closer, if we go closer uh, than F in between the focal and the lens, then we will have a virtual image. And then we're going to have um, this coming in and uh, in parallel out through the focal, but there is no focal. So it's, well, sorry, in parallel out through the focal. So there, there it is there. And you trace it back forever. And then the other one is harder to draw. Um, the other one, you go um, straight through the origin. If you go straight through the origin, you don't refract at all. And then you come straight backwards. And where those two meet is going to be the location of the image. So here you see that the light rays are over here. The light rays are over here. However, the image is over here. So this is going to be a virtual image because the light rays are not physically converging or passing through the image. It's, it's merely an optical illusion. You know, if your eyes were placed over here, 
I don't know why, hold on, green, there we go. If your eyes were placed over here, they would be tricked into thinking the light is appearing or coming from or originating over here. So that would be an optical illusion. Okay, um, the next few slides are literally just a zoomed in version of each of those panels, just to you know, make it slightly easier for you to read. Okay, so here is a conceptual, oops, here is a conceptual question here. In the figure below, which of the rays, A, B, C, or D, did not originate from uh, point Q, which is uh, known to be the top of the blue arrow? So I would just draw and see what happens. So in parallel, and then out through the focal. 2F, don't forget 2F is just a radius of curvature. So in parallel, out through the focal. So A, A looks like it's good. Um, we also have uh, in, oh boy, in through the focal and out parallel. So if we go in through the focal as if we are aiming for this guy, and then we would go out parallel. So B, B looks okay. And we also have the one that I rarely talk about. Again, if you go through the origin, it does not bend at all. So if you aim through the origin, then it passes through unbent. We call this the principal, the principal ray. I don't know why they call it the principal ray, but they do. Um, I rarely use the principal ray ever, so that goes to show you how important it is. Um, so that one looks that one looks good, but D D, however, um, there's there's no way there's no way to get D at all. So um, that tells you D did not come from the top of point Q. Now I'm not saying there isn't a ray D that looks like this. It just, it doesn't necessarily come from the top of point Q. It might come from a different location. Okay, um, one of the last things we have to, to talk about for the uh, you know, geometric optics is what happens when we have two lenses. So a two lens system. Now, really, the thing here to keep in mind is the image of the, oh, actually, hold on, before I say that, before I say that, let me just clear up any misconceptions. What do I mean when I say a two lens system? Okay, well, let's say I have one lens here. Okay, and uh, you know, maybe I draw an apple here. Okay, um, we can draw the apple, we can draw the image, and then we know the image of the apple might be inverted. And uh, kind of over, over here, right? Okay, so we've studied that. We know that we can use a thin lens equation to, to figure out uh, where that is. What do I mean by a two lens system? Well, simply, we just have a second lens. We have a second lens somewhere nearby, close, far, wherever you are, or what, what, what is that Celine Dion song? Near, far, where, any, anyway, bad, bad physics Celine Dion joke. Anyway, um, a two lens system literally means two lenses. Okay, so hopefully I've cleared up that, that terminology for you. Here's the trick. There is nothing new here, nothing new conceptually. Okay, here's the trick. The output of lens number one is the input for lens number two. What do I mean by that? I mean the image of lens one is the object, oops, 
got ahead of myself, object of lens two. That's all it is. It means you are performing the same analysis twice in a row. That's it. So a two lens system is really two questions in one question. You're doing uh, one over DO plus one over DI equals one over F twice. That's all it means. So here's an example of what I mean by that. Wow, this, okay, here. Here's what I mean by that. Let's say we have a two lens system. We have one lens here and a second lens here. Okay, two lens system. Step one, ignore the second lens. I love when my step one is to ignore something because that's easy to do. So step one, ignore the second lens. All right, so how do we analyze this? Well, um, I, don't know, I don't know what the fascination with physicists and penguins is, but for some reason penguins crop up quite, quite a lot in physics textbooks, but anyway. Um, let's say our object here is a penguin, hypothetically speaking. Well, all you do is you, you figure out where its image is going to be based on your thin, thin film equation, or not thin film, your, your, um, your thin lens equation. So, um, you know, if the focal point is here, we're beyond the focal point, so we're going to get an inverted real image. Okay, so fine, we're going to get an inverted real image. This is real. Okay, cool beans. Um, now, that's step one. No problemo. Step two, or I guess step two would have been to analyze. So step three is to now ignore the first lens because we've already dealt with it. We've already propagated it. So ignore it and then reinstate the notion of the second lens. So we, we, we ignore the first lens and we reinstate the second lens. Okay. And then all you do is um, you propagate that one forward. So you say, okay, this used to be, used to be the image, but don't forget the image, the light rays are physically going through there, physically. So in that case, that's as good as an object. So as far as lens number two is concerned, this, is the oh, oops, object is not service now object as far as lens number two is concerned that's an object that's what lens number two sees lens number two sees the output of lens number one the image of, of lens number one so then you just recalculate it and propagate it that way and that's all you do that is literally literally all you do okay now, the same is true for a diverging lens. And you can have a combination of these. You can have a diverging lens in conjunction with a converging lens. You can have a converging lens in conjunction with a diverging lens. You can mix and match. You can have two diverging lenses, okay? Really, whatever, two lenses. That's just four combinations. You have convex concave and you've got two of them. So two times two is four. You have four different combinations. There's no point memorizing the pattern here. You're, there's just too much in this course to memorize. Please understand that two lenses simply means nothing new. It's just the output of the, of the first one is the input for the second one. And you simply just analyze them separately. And that's all you do. You analyze them separately. Okay. So um, is there an example? Yeah. So here's an example. Um, we don't have time at the moment to do it, but we might do this example first thing tomorrow morning, just as a bit of a refresher for you to kind of recap both this, the thin lens equation as well as what it means to have a double lens system. So uh, I would encourage you to maybe review it today if you have some time. If not, you want to study for the test or finish your lab, whatever. Um, we, will do, we will do this tomorrow morning as a refresher. Um, the last thing I'll mention before letting you go is um, don't forget, if the output of one is the input for the other one, then there'll be a second output from the second lens. And the first lens had, had its own magnification and um, producing an image from the first lens to be either bigger or smaller according to the M value. But that's the input for the second lens. 
So the second lens will then uh, magnify or compress, but magnify the, the uh, new input for itself and, and apply its own magnification to it. So if the first lens magnified it by a factor of two and the second lens magnifies what it sees by a factor of five, then it was already stretched by a factor of two, so five times two is 10. So the overall magnification of a two lens system is the product of the individual magnifications. And you can see this in a microscope as well. You've got the eyepiece um, or the objective, and then you have the, the, um, the three different options, little swirly giggers. I call them swirly giggers. I'm pretty sure that's not the actual name for them. Um, at the bottom, it's always got like the, the, the five, the 10, and the 50 or something like that. You can rotate between them. So the overall magnification of, of a microscope is the product of the eyepiece and the objective together. And uh, that's how you get the overall magnification. So yeah, um, I think we're, we're mostly done. We're, we're mostly done geometric optics now. Um, we've done lenses, we've done mirrors, we've done ray diagrams, and we've done the thin lens equation and magnification. So all of geometric optics is pretty much done now. Um, all we're really doing is practice. So tomorrow we'll do some practice. Um, tomorrow I will review with you the ray diagrams and uh, maybe that'll take an hour and then we'll move on to the wave nature of light. So optics, I don't wanna downplay optics here. I mean, I'm making it sound like there isn't a lot to it. Um, there's, there's a lot of different scenarios with optics. There's a lot of different ray diagrams. Are you, are you closer than the focal? Are you beyond the focal? There's a lot of patterns involved. What happens to the image as the object gets closer to the focal? What happens as it gets farther away from the focal? Right? There's all these sort of nuances to, to these equations, but they all boil down to the thin lens equation, pretty much, that one over DO plus one over DI equals one over F. So um, practice and exposure will help you to feel more comfortable with the material. Um, but please understand that there's a lot of nuance, you know, even with the minus sign that like you've seen me make the plus minus sign error a few times in lecture. So it's just, it's one of those things that this is a very nuanced chapter. There's a lot of nitpicky detail and uh, the only way to really become comfortable with it is, is to practice. So um, just fair warning, if practice, practice makes perfect. Okay, that's all for today. Uh, I will stop the recording and I will hang around on, on um, the chat and answer any outstanding questions.